Greetings, Greenhouse people, and welcome to another installment of Tech on Demand, where our goal is always to bring you tips, tricks, and information to produce your best crops ever. I'm your host, Bill Calkins, and I'm happy to be joined once again by Dr. Nathan Jonke, one of the newest technical services members at Ball Horticultural Company and part of the Ball Tech on Demand team. He's our cultural research manager and works in the greenhouses in West Chicago. So Nathan, how's the research shaping up for the coming year? I'm sure you guys are keeping busy. Hey Bill, things are going well. Uh, yeah, we got lots of projects, really cool things going on and hopefully gonna be giving some uh, new updates to our customers and growers here in the near future. Excellent, excellent. I'm sure they're looking for it. I know that the research teams at Ball never ever sit still. There's always projects in the works and you're gonna really understand that very soon. <laughs> yes. So let's push forward on this topic since as they say, time is money and we are back to talk about at-risk crops and the inherent challenges with specific crops grown across North America. Like I've been saying, at-risk crops are commonly grown plants that do often come under pressure from pest or disease. And Nathan's going to join us this time to focus on Hamalis begonias in anticipation of the coming season. So Nathan, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and kick us off with a quick overview of the disease triangle, because it is of extreme importance when it comes to almost all of these at-risk crops and especially these Hamalis begonias. So, and as a reminder to the listeners and viewers, these are just the highlights. You can find an in-depth overview presentation and document covering at-risk crops, and I'll put those links in the show notes. So Nathan, why don't you go ahead and take us through uh, this triangle? Yeah, so thanks, Bill. Um, as we talked about, this triangle is our bread and butter for plant pathology. We have to have three key points in order to get disease development, and that includes our plants, the environment, and our pathogen. And these are gonna be very important in the next few slides here when we talk about uh, Hemolus begonia. And one of the main key things is starting with clean inputs. After that, we really need to make sure we're starting clean in our greenhouses and maintaining that cleanliness uh, throughout production and after we turn it over. Uh, so maintain those cultural protocol protocols. And then again, later on, we're gonna see that monitoring and controlling pests for uh, this crop is gonna be key. Absolutely, I think these are best practices that can't be overstated and you need to continue to go over these with your production teams throughout the year. Um, don't assume that they know this, don't assume that, uh, that they're following all of the protocols, really stay on top of it and continue training, training, training. So I think that covers the basics. So why don't we go ahead and turn our attention to Hamalus begonias, which I always consider one of the most beautiful crops. I mean, you see a, a basket or container of Hamalus begonias and you really can't help but walk over and look at the blooms. They're absolutely beautiful, been around a long time and continue to generate excitement with home gardeners and all sorts of shoppers. So why don't you start by sharing some of the specific risk factors? Um, we're looking at bacteria and virus primarily, right? Yeah, so one of our common pathogens that we have some other at-risk crops uh, information on is uh, Xanthomonas, that bacterial leaf spot that is a thorn in our sides. That's gonna be issue again with these begonias. And as we know with bacteria, uh, it's everywhere and it can be slimy and it can be nasty. Uh, the main symptoms we're gonna see on these begonias are that uh, characteristic necrotic brown lesion, but something to watch out for is that these will actually start as a water soaked spot on the leaf tissue that'll then turn yellow and then brown. So that's the process that we're going through and the symptomology that we need to train our uh, growers and our employees on for identification. Uh, with bacteria, it can uh, thrive in water and wet environments. So the way that this is going to be transmitted is through contact and water. So in our uh, management of this disease, we need to think about that. And so we are avoiding uh, very wet situations and especially watering overhead. Now, as I said, uh, this is a, a common pathogen on some other crops too, uh, but this Xanthomonas is specific to begonia. So in a way we can be happy that if you have bacterial leaf spot on this begonia, it's not gonna be transmitted to other uh, species that also get Xanthomonas. So uh, something to watch out for, but a lot of our control uh, mechanisms are gonna be the same uh, for this specific pathogen. We also have viruses, as you said, and these are our TOSPO viruses and they're gonna cause two commonly seen viruses out in the floriculture world 
in patients necrotic spot virus, or INSV, and tomato spotted wilt virus, or TMV. Both are uh, super prolific and hard to get a control of if you have it in the greenhouse, so we really need to be careful. Uh, this is going to cause your characteristic virus symptomology with that mosaic pattern, as you see on the right hand of our screen. Also, you're going to see stem and vein necrosis, stunting of your plants, and you can actually get distortion in your foliage and poor flowering as well. So this is a, a major issue that's going to cause these plants to not be saleable uh, when you're ready to finish them. Uh, now these viruses, this one, these ones in particular are going to be vectored or transmitted through thrips, another pest that is a thorn on our side, right? And they're everywhere and they're hard to get a control of. And what happens is that when thrips in our immature stage feed on an infected plant, uh, that will actually come into and be produced in their saliva. So they're going out and infecting more plants, um, but the adults can't get that virus. So early control of our threat populations is going to be key here, as we'll see in the next slide. And as we said, uh, these viruses are common uh, on a lot of other different crops, and thrips can transmit them to different crops as well. So uh, something to keep track of here. Makes a lot of sense. And two things that jump out at me there are poor flowering. That's the last thing you want when it comes to begonias. And the fact that like a lot of times you've got a, a disease issue that can be transmitted by an insect. So it's really a matter of, of staying on top of things in the greenhouse um, and that cleanliness that you mentioned early on. So I think we have a little bit of a better understanding of both bacterial leaf spot and the TOSPO viruses. So what are some strategies and controls to minimize and manage this risk? Because begonias are an at-risk crop. That's why they're part of this series and diseased begonias are gonna be really tough to sell. So why don't you uh, take us through some ways to, uh, I guess, to grow them clean and healthy. Right, so when we think about that disease triangle, we have to have those three parts. And again, we look back on purchasing inputs from reliable suppliers. Uh, with uh, BLS or our bacterial leaf spot, uh, we need to make sure that our suppliers are producing these plants under strict cultural practices. So uh, they're monitoring for these diseases. They're uh, spraying protective uh, bactericides like copper, of which you can go into the document online and find some more information about how to spray those coppers uh, to protect your crops. Because once you get that bacteria, uh, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get rid of it. So protectants are the way to go for our bacterial leaf spots. For our TOSPO viruses, uh, we're really looking at the management of that uh, through removal of that plant, um, but more specifically looking at the management of our thrip populations. So here we have the uh, life cycle of our Western flower thrips. And as I said earlier, those immature stages are gonna be the ones that get the virus. So we need to monitor and control them. So uh, when we get it plants in, we're monitoring for uh, necrotic spots on our leaves, but we're also monitoring for thrips that are coming in. And once those plants come in, we rogue them out that are symptom symptomatic. And then we implement uh, strategies like the copper I said, or an, uh, keep sure your insecticide program going to keep your thrip populations low. And the, one of the ways you monitor your thrip populations is getting out those sticky cards out onto the benches and have a person scouting every week and counting the number of thrips on those cards. Once you reach uh, the threshold that you have uh, put in place for your greenhouse, every greenhouse is different. We're always looking at thresholds of thrips. Uh, then you know it's time to implement a spray program. But if you have these viruses, um, the time is to have a zero tolerance for thrips in your greenhouse. Then we look at sanitizing equipment and spaces uh, and in your production blocks, right? If you have infected material, your uh, employees need to be trained on making sure that they're wearing gloves, especially when we're dealing with our bacterial leaf spot, as that's gonna be transmitted through contact and water, avoiding uh, watering overhead as well. And then with our TOSPO viruses, we wanna get that infected material out as soon as possible and never compost it or use it in any other situations that you're gonna be growing plants for finishing or selling because they will be transmitted uh, if we're breaking and getting plant sap and thrips uh, piercing into those other plants as well.
And of course, we want healthy plants. So minimize that environmental stress and anything you can do culturally to grow your healthy plants so that they can re resist pathogens and disease. Because we want begonias looking like the one on the bottom screen here. I was just about to say that you ship a basket that looks like that one on the screen, it's going to sell super fast and everybody is going to be happy throughout the entire supply chain. So I appreciate all of that. You gave some fantastic information um, on, on how uh, growers can work to control and uh, minimize the risk with Hamalus begonias. So before we wrap it up, I just want to call out a few additional resources for the viewers and listeners to check out. First is our set of at-risk crop guides and white papers that are available at ballseed.com. We've got documents, videos, and audio podcasts uh, covering all of these different at-risk crops. Uh, you'll find that at ballseed.com slash quickculture slash production guides. You can also find the link in the show notes for this presentation. Also is our Tech on Demand podcast brought to you by Grower Talks. In addition to episodes like this one, you're going to find many other podcasts covering a range of greenhouse specific topics with more being added all the time. You can subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, pretty much all of them, or visit growertalks.com slash tech on demand and click on the links. So Nathan, thank you so much for your time today covering this important crop and for all the work that our technical team and experts at Ball do on behalf of growers around the world. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Bill. It was fun. Absolutely. And I'm Bill Calkins with Tech on Demand, wishing you a fantastic season.